Thank you, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. I want to start this talk off by asking you all a question. How many of you have heard of Atwood's Law before? OK, a surprisingly few number of you. Well, Atwood's Law, for those of you that are not familiar with it, simply states that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. <laughs> now, when Jeff Atwood said this, also known as Coding Horror Online, it was kind of just a funny observation. This was like 11 years ago that he first wrote this. But over the years since then, it has become remarkably accurate. Right? We write so many applications in JavaScript these days. Our chat applications are now written with JavaScript. Our music players. And even our own development tools that we then write more JavaScript with. In my opinion, that's really fascinating. But it's not just new things. We can also recreate old school applications, like Winamp. And we can do this completely in the browser. That's, in my opinion, really marvelous. But beyond that, we can even develop progressive web applications now that have native-like application features, such as push notifications and offline content. But we can go even beyond just applications themselves and develop runtimes for other languages, like Java or Ruby in JavaScript. Now, I don't know why you would actually want to do this, other than as a cool experiment, but it's really awesome. It's astounding, in my opinion, what JavaScript can do these days. And that's kind of at the heart of what I want to talk about today. And it's represented by this picture of the magnificent Idris Elba. I'm a huge fan of his, and I love the show Luther. But really, what I want you to focus on is actually the fact that this image is showing up in a web browser at all. You see, this image format is actually in a format that's been encrypted. So it's not a normal PNG, which means that by default, the browser should not be able to display this. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if you loaded this up in pretty much any other browser other than in the application that I had coded, you would just get an error. And it would be very confusing. And so what I want to talk about today is how we can create and serve our own custom image formats and deliver new experiences to users that feel like they're native to the browser. And so while I think this topic is really cool in its own right, it's going to serve us a platform for us to learn about some cool new web technologies that are available today. Before we jump into all that, though, who am I? My name is Trent Willis. I work at Netflix as a UI engineer. But more importantly, for the purposes of this talk today, I'm just someone that really loves the web, and I really love JavaScript, mainly because I found a lot of freedom and creativity with those technologies. And I think that there's a lot to be found there for others as well. And what's really exciting to me about this particular moment in web development history that we find ourselves in is that JavaScript and the web platform are evolving pretty rapidly. And that's what spurred this talk. There's lots of cool stuff out there that we can experiment, experiment with. And I found a really interesting piece of information about a year ago. And that is what led to this topic. So what was that piece of information? Well, I was looking at a specification from the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, better known by the abbreviation, WhatWig. I was reading their specification for their Streams API, which aims to provide a set of interfaces for the web platform to interact with streaming data. This is similar to what is already in Node.js, like we heard about earlier from Luciano, but it's native to the web platform. What was interesting to me, though, is that in reading the spec, one of the use cases they identify is that if a stream is installed inside the fetch hook of a service worker, this would allow developers to transparently polyfill new image formats. And that got me thinking, that's pretty awesome. I had never considered using service workers for anything outside of normal progressive web app functionality. And I got even more excited about this idea as I thought about how important images are for the web, right? From funny memes all the way up to Photos of influential figures. Photos, in my opinion, are a really, really important part of our web experience. It's how we consume and relate to content a lot these days. I would go so far as to say that without photos, the web is almost kind of boring. So wouldn't it be really awesome if we could experiment with them? Try out new image formats, custom encodings that feel like they're native to the browser. Do things with images that we historically have not been able to. I think so. I think that's cool. But being a pragmatic person, I also tried to think of a way in which we could do this that would provide real value, real benefits to our users. And while I was thinking about all these ideas, I came across another web API that I was relatively unfamiliar with. 
and that is the Web Crypto API, which is a built-in module in the browser that defines methods to allow you to do things like encrypt and decrypt data. And I thought to myself, hey, that gives me an idea. It might not be a good idea, but it's an idea. And that is, what if we combined both of those APIs and built an encrypted image format in a privacy-conscious world that seems like something that could provide real value to folks? And I started thinking, like, okay, this is cool. Let's, let's do it. What am I going to name it? Well, I figured it should have crypto in the name. And the first thing that comes to mind these days when I think of images is Instagram. So I was like, I'll name it Cryptogram. About 10 minutes after that, I decided, though, oh, cryptogram already has another meaning. But I had already created the repo, and so that's what we're sticking with. And so for the remainder of this talk, we're going to talk about how exactly I built this, implemented an encrypted image format in the browser. Before we jump into the code, though, we need to think about what it is we're building. We're going to start with an encrypted image. This is going to basically just be a PNG that we ran through an encryption algorithm. We want to be able to display that in the browser like any other images, using a normal image element tag and simply specifying a source path. We know, however, that this won't work right now because browsers can only display image formats they have knowledge of, like PNGs, JPEGs, or GIFs. And so, how do we get around this? Well, we need to focus on what the problem is. The problem is that by the time that data reaches the browser, the browser doesn't know how to interpret that data. And so we can work around this by using a service worker. With a service worker, many of us are probably aware that it's how we build progressive or offline web apps. But what we may not think of them as is actually a proxy that kind of sits in between as a middleman between our applications and all of the external resources we're connecting to. But when we think of them in this light, it becomes a lot easier to understand how we might polyfill this functionality we need. We do it by loading the encrypted image file, and on its way back to the browser, we transform it into a normal PNG file. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get a .epng and then convert it to a .png. And the browser will be none the wiser. And it'll work, hopefully. That's the high level idea. So let's actually build it. A note before I jump into the code here, all of this code is going to be available online, and there's going to be quite a bit of it. So don't worry about taking thorough notes. There will be links out to demos where you can look at the source and read all the comments that I have in there. So just buckle in, and let's have some fun. So to get started, there are two APIs we need to be familiar with in terms of service workers. The first is known as a fetch event. So the fetch event is essentially at the heart of all service worker functionality. It is an event that gets emitted to a service worker any time an external request gets made on a page where that service worker is active. So essentially, if you have a service worker, any time you make an XHR request, a fetch request, or the browser requests an image for an image tag or a script for a script element, you are going to get one of these events. The event contains a lot of information, most notably stuff about the request, such as the URL that it's requesting. Now, this by itself doesn't do a whole lot for us, right? We don't want to just know that the browser is making those requests. We want to do something with them. And so we need another method as part of this API. And that is the respond with method that is actually on the fetch event object we get. It allows you to take that event and say, hey, don't respond with that original value. Instead, respond with this other value. And this is how offline web apps work. We say, don't respond with the network request. Instead, take this cache value I already have and respond with that instead. So with knowledge of these two IEPIs, these two concepts, let's write our first code. We're going to start by registering a service worker for our application. Like so. I like to be obvious with my naming, so I just named the file service worker JS. And in that file, we are going to define an event listener for fetch events. Now, by default, if we don't do anything with this event, the browser will behave as normal. And that's great. That's what we want it to do for the vast majority of use cases. But if we get a request that is for an encrypted image, we want to do something else. Now, you'll notice in this if statement, I added a function is encrypted image request. And that's because, one, I find it makes the code a lot more readable and easier to understand. But then, two, these checks, these conditions, can get kind of complicated for requests. In our case, however, we're going to keep it pretty simple. We're going to simply check that if the request URL ends with the extension .epng. If it does, then we're going to assume it is an encrypted image that we're loading. And so 
if we have an encrypted image, what do we want to do next? Well, we want to take that fetch event, and we want it to respond with a new PNG image that we're going to generate from that original encrypted image request. Now, this is actually pretty much all of the service worker-specific code that's in this talk. Everything else we're going to look at could be written in the main thread or in the service worker. There's not a lot that you need to know in the realm of service workers. So how do we actually implement this function, though? How do we convert a PNG or get a PNG from an encrypted image? Well, we need to do a couple things. First, we're going to fetch the data from our original request. Then we need to get that data from the request as an array buffer. When dealing with images, you often deal with either array buffers or arrays of integers because they provide for a better representation of the image data, more so than objects or strings usually do. And so once we have that data, we are then going to run it through a decrypt function, which we'll write in a moment. We can then turn that decrypted data into a new data blob that we can use as a response and encode it as a PNG. Finally, we construct that new response and return it to our respond with method. Now, there's a good bit of interesting code here, but we really want to focus on just these two lines, because this is what actually happens, functions as our encrypted image format, our custom image format. In fact, if we were to change some of the variable names and add another parameter, we actually get a generic, pluggable way of defining a custom image transformation. As long as you define a transform function that returns to you PNG data from the data that you get originally, it should work. So at this point, let's try to test our code. And we're going to get this, a broken image, but we also get an error, which shows that our code is executing in the way we expect it to. The only problem is, is we don't have a decrypt data function implemented yet. And so we're right on track. Everything is breaking just as we would expect it to. So next, we're going to implement that decrypt data function. So we're going to use the Web Crypto API, as I alluded to earlier. It's at the core of the image format here. And again, there are two primary concepts that we need to understand about this API. The first is what's known as the subtle crypto part of it. And this is actually the namespace that you'll find it in in the web browser. This API provides a set of cryptographic primitives for us to do things like encrypt and decrypt data, but then also do things such as sign or verify the integrity of that data. It's named subtle crypto to reflect the fact that many of the algorithms that it provides have subtle usage requirements in order to provide the required algorithmic security guarantees. In other words, cryptography in my opinion, is very fascinating, but it's also very complicated. And if you're going to use it as an actual part of your security measures, you need to understand all the implications that go along with it. However, for this talk, we are more interested in the general concept, so I'm not going to dive into that stuff too much. But this is your warning to not just use these willy-nilly and actually have some sort of plan and understanding in place. So the second API we need to understand as part of this is the crypto key. A crypto key as you might guess, represents a key used in all the crypto API methods. Every method requires a key because every method has a corresponding algorithm. And without the keys, the algorithms are not going to work the way you expect it to. So with those two concepts in mind, let's actually put this into our code. If we go back to our function, we're going to start implementing the decrypt data method. Here, we're going to receive our encrypted data. And then we need to get our crypto key for that data. I'm not going to show how this function is implemented. I'll leave that as an exercise for you all because it's not that interesting. In short, all you really need to know is that the key that you get needs to be the same key or part of the key pair that was used when the image was originally encrypted, or else you're not going to be able to decrypt it. Next, we're going to define the decryption options that we want to use. Here, we are using the AES algorithm in counter mode, or CTR. I'll talk more about that in a bit. But for now, just know that it requires two arguments, a counter, which is a uint8 array, and then a length, which we're going to specify as 128. Now, with those options, we can call the, the crypto.subtle.decrypt method, pass it our algorithm options, our crypto key, and then our encrypted data. And that's going to return to us a promise that will resolve with the decrypted data. And that's pretty much it. Once we get that value returned to our respond with function we had earlier, it should work. So 
Here's a quick demo of this in action. We start with a broken image. Doesn't seem to be working. This is because our service worker is not enabled. But if we enable it and reload the page, voila, it works. You can find this demo online at cryptogram-naive.glitch.me. And so I would encourage you to check it out at some point. It has some interesting nuances that I didn't cover fully in this talk. There are some things that I may have gone over kind of fast, so it's worthwhile to kind of dig into it, really understand it. Uh, I looked at MDN quite a bit while I was putting this together the first time. But we have that working, but it's kind of a naive solution. And I had mentioned streams earlier, and we haven't done anything with those yet. So let's focus on optimizing this, push it a little bit further, see what else the web platform can do for us. We know that the three tenets of good software that are often cited are to first make it work, then make it right, and then finally make it fast. At this point, we know our polyfill is working, and we know that it is producing the right results. But how do we make it fast? Because it's not really that fast right now. And the reason for that is, is in order to decrypt any of this data, we first have to download all of it. For small images, this is fine, but for larger images, if you have to download all of the data first and then decrypt all of it, that means you have to hold all of that image in memory twice while this process happens. Not to mention there's this huge period of time at the beginning where you're not doing any work. And so this is effectively a form of batch processing because we wait for all the data to show up and then process it in one giant batch. What could we do to make this better? Well, as we might have learned earlier in the day, we could use stream processing instead. We can process the data as it arrives bit by bit. Now, if you weren't here for the talk earlier or weren't paying that close of attention, we're going to recap what that means real quick. So like before, we download the data, but after we've downloaded a small chunk of it, we can start to process that data. And as that process is happening, we can download more data. And then we simply repeat this process until everything is downloaded and all of the work has been done. And the result is that much of the work that we used to have to do after we downloaded all the data, we can now do while we're downloading the data. And that should save us a good chunk of time. And not to mention, save us some memory. Now, this won't be the same as not having to do any work, obviously, but it does provide a nice speed up over the naive solution we had before. So if that's the idea, let's see how we would implement it. If we jump back into our polyfill function, we can start by changing a few of these lines. So that instead of returning a PNG blob, we're actually returning a PNG stream. Let's walk through this real quick. We're going to start by fetching the image. Same as last time, nothing's changed there. And then we're going to construct a new transform stream with a decryptor object that we'll implement in a moment. And then finally, we'll call pipe through on the response body and pipe it through the transform stream. Now, this might seem a little odd or esoteric to you, but the body of a fetch request is actually a readable stream. This is a relatively new addition, but it's really powerful. And what we're doing here is essentially saying, hey, take the response body, and as all the data for it arrives, gets streamed down by your server, run or pipe it through this transform method. And so we get a new stream that represents that transform data. And finally, we want to construct a new response out of that stream and return that to our fetch event. So that's the gist of what needs to happen. And at a high level, it's kind of readable. But all this stuff about transform streams might be a little confusing because it's a very new specification to the browser. And they actually work differently from how streams in Node.js work. So the streams API still has two primary concepts like the Node.js one, and, that are, and those are readable, writable streams and readable streams. As mentioned before, writable streams obviously represent a stream of data that you can write to. It's kind of your destination of where you are sending data. Readable streams are then streams of data that you read or access and get data out of. And so a transform stream is just a combination of these two types of streams with a function sitting between them to transform the data. And so you can actually construct a transform stream in the browser using both of these types of streams and then adding some logic to wire them up. This, however, is not very fun and it takes a lot of overhead. And so the spec authors thought ahead and said, 
we could provide a better abstraction for this. And that takes place in the transform stream constructor. And it's through an interface known as a transformer. A transformer is an object that simply defines, can optionally define three methods. Those are start, transform, and flush. The start method allows us to define some state or any pre-work that we need to do before we start actually receiving data. The transform method is then called every time we receive a chunk of data to process. And then we finally call flush once we've received all of the data and we've got a signal that the stream is going to close. So let's see this in action rather than all hypothetical. If we take our decryptor class, it's actually an implementation of a transformer. You'll notice that all these methods in the class are async, so they can return promises, which plays really nicely with the fact that we're having to use the crypto API because all of those methods are async as well. So in our start method, we're going to set up a counter. Same as before, it's a uint8 array. And what this is actually going to do is allow us to count the number of blocks of data that we've decrypted. And this is important when we're streaming data because we're not going to do all the work at once, and so we need to track where we're at in the process. Then we're going to get our key. It's going to be the same key for each chunk of data that we decrypt, so we only need to do it once. That's it for the start method. In our transform method, we're going to start then by getting a chunk of data, and then we get a controller that controls the interactions between the input and output streams. We're going to get the length of that data and divide it by 16. And the reason we do this is because the encryption algorithm we're using, we specified a length of 128, which stands for 128 bits, which translates to 16 bytes. And so if we take the length, divide it by 16, and then take the floor of that, we have the number of full blocks of data that are present in our chunk. And so we can then decrypt that data and increment our counter by however many blocks we just decrypted. Unfortunately, working with UN8 arrays is not very easy, and so you have to write a custom function to do this increment for you. Um, you could go look at the code for it. It's not very interesting. Um, so you can find it in the demo once we're done with this. Now, the observant among you might have noticed that there's potential for us to get a length that is not perfectly divisible by 16, in which case we can't increment our counter by an integer. And so we have to write a little more code to deal with this. And that is to simply find the remainder of the data that, we don't, that doesn't fit into a perfect block and then save it off until the next run. And the next time we receive more data, we can then concatenate that or prepend it to the new chunk of data. Basically, until we get to the end of the stream, we need to make sure we're operating on complete blocks of data each time. Otherwise, we're going to lose our place and the decryption won't work properly. So we can collapse all of that. And then we have one last function, and that is the flush method. And here, we are going to check if we have any leftover data from the transform method. And if we do, we decrypt it. We don't care about incrementing anymore because we're at the end. And then that's it. That is our streaming implementation. And so we're going to look at another demo. Same as before. This one, we start with a broken image. But if we re-enable the service worker, we'll begin to see the image appear. But I've purposefully slowed it down here so that way we see it come in a bit at a time. And you can see all the different chunks of data that we're decrypting. Now, this image is a pretty large image. I think it's about 20 megs. And so it seems kind of like it's loading slow. But if we remove the artificial slowdown that I inserted, this actually goes pretty quickly, which is why I added the slowdown earlier. And this is awesome, because it shows that we can polyfill these custom image formats and have them actually be somewhat performant. So you can find this demo on Glitch as well at cryptogram-streaming.glitch.me. Now, I realize we just covered a ton of code, and a lot of it is kind of low level, right? it's below all those frameworks and libraries that we're used to working with. And that's because a lot of these things are pretty new on the web platform. And that's kind of the real point of this talk today. It wasn't necessarily to show that we can implement our own image format. It's really just to show that there is a lot of cool stuff we can now do on the web platform that was not previously possible. Technologies like streams, web crypto, and service workers provide us with a lot of building blocks to build really cool and not always practical ideas. And so as I've been thinking about all these technologies and related topics over the last year, there's a few other ideas that have come into my mind. So let's talk about those real quick before I end. 
For instance, what if you used WebAssembly? Incorporated WebAssembly into those transform streams, and you got some lightning fast data transformations. You could then compose those together by piping through multiple of them. You could even implement new encryption algorithms or decryption algorithms using WebAssembly and have them perform very quickly. Or what if we took that ability to intercept requests at runtime and change how we think about our development workflows? Right, what if you could have streaming compilation for your TypeScript projects at runtime in the browser? You no longer have to run a local build process. And instead, your browser just knows that, hey, I'm loading a TypeScript file. I should compile this and then cache the result, and then only recompile it on the next load if it's changed. That would be awesome. I hate running local build systems, so this would be a really awesome feature to me. Or maybe you could completely polyfill extensions to the web platform. Right? What if we could load HTML files into our JavaScript modules and then just reference them like a JavaScript object? This would be really powerful and give us new ways to do templating in our JavaScript applications. And while we're talking about ES modules, why not experiment with being able to import assets by their package name, such as in the package name maps proposal? I polyfilled this, but it's now starting to ship in browsers, and so it may not be super worthwhile to check out. But the point is, it's possible. You can do a lot of things that you used to not be able to. And finally, what about inserting video effects at runtime in the browser? If you get a stream of video data, you could transform it. And if you're using fast transformations implemented in WebAssembly, you could insert real-time effects into those live streaming videos. That would be incredible, in my opinion. Now, obviously, this isn't all the topics, all the potential things that we could do here. These are just a few ideas that I've been mulling over for the last few months. And so while today I talked about and showed how we can implement our own custom image format, there's so much more that you can do. And I really want to encourage you all to just have fun, experiment with some of these new things. Whether it's streams and web crypto, or just the next generation of ECMAScript functionality, or web components, have fun. These are all setting the stage for us to build more ambitious and exciting projects than we ever have before in the history of the web. So I'd love to see what you've built. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter with that or what you're going to build in the future or what your ideas are. And go forth. Fulfill Atwood's law. Write everything that you can think of in JavaScript. Thank you.